Okay, I think I might start uh, with the lecture series tonight. First of all, I want to welcome everybody, colleagues, friends, students to this lecture series, Communities of Tacit Knowledge, Architecture and its Ways of Knowing. Um, we, you see, we will we return to online for various reasons. Um, yeah, uh, it it turned out that it is the easiest way to continue with the lecture series since we are all juggling with different dates in the calendar, and it was easier now to manage the lecture series in an online format. So not only this lecture tonight will be online, also the next one and also the last one at the same time uh, on June 27th will also be online uh, lectures by Tim Anstey and Jennifer Mack. So um, tonight um, we continue with the lecture series as uh, Communities of Tacit Knowledge. It's uh, an European founded research project run by Tom Abermatte and the ETH Zurich. And it is the basis for this lecture series talks or at or actually it's the combi the combination out of the uh, ICA annual lecture series and the format of the tacit knowledge talks which are organized by the research project is now uh, what you are uh, attending uh, tonight or one of the lectures you are attending. Um, IKA or the Academy of Fine Arts and the Institute of Art and Architecture or to be concrete, Eva Sommeregger, my colleague uh, who is also here, uh, 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 here one of these windows, <laughs> these small windows and me, we are partners in this European network, one of the 10 academic partners. And the idea was that we want to share or to learn there all these individual views, position approaches to the topic of tacit knowledge in architecture uh, in the frame of this annual lecture series. Last time with the lectures by Peg Ross and Christoph Grafe, we learned that tacit knowing also challenges the traditional epistemology with its notion of an autonomous and superior subject or individual. Hence, not only the autonomy of the individual designer, also the researcher who wants to understand, read, analyze architecture and its various design techniques and methods needs to find new paths, in particular uh, when addressing the tacit dimension uh, in architecture itself. So tonight I am pleased to introduce two scholars, one, of, from, one from Milano and one from Hanover, who will share their personal approaches with uh, you, with the audience. One of the lectures is co even called My Tacit Knowledge, uh, and this might be also in some way also the roof title for tonight's uh, talk. Um, originally, we wanted to have even three lectures tonight, but uh, Gaia Caramelino, the third partner or the, the another partner from Milan, unfortunately, she cannot join tonight, so we are just uh, two, but I think we will learn a lot uh, from from them. So just uh, before I introduce these two, just a few words about the organization and the procedure. This lecture talk will again will be streamed via YouTube. Uh, this service is made uh, available through Martin Rush uh, from the ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, but there is also audience present in the Zoom space. Um, for technical reasons, we need both, so that's uh, another uh, topic. However, everyone who is following the lecture, either on YouTube or on Zoom, um, 
can participate. Uh, if you are live on YouTube, please uh, use uh, put your questions in, in the chat. Martin will gather them and will pass on them to me or to here to the Zoom space. And for those who are following uh, on Zoom, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. Uh, as well. And uh, Eva and me, we will try to moderate and uh, gather uh, the questions as good as possible. Um, so tonight we will have uh, two lectures, each of them between 20 and 30 minutes. And afterwards, uh, we immediately start with the discussion. Um, you, you, you do not have to wait until uh, there is a kind of a moderation, of course, by myself and by Eva, but nevertheless, feel free to ask your questions just immediately, just as if you were all to, we were all together in a physical space as uh, always. So our first guest now is uh, Magita Buchert. She will start with the lecture with the title In Between Realms. Uh, Margitta is holding um, a, the chair for architecture and art in the 20th and 21st century at the Faculty of Architecture and Landscape Sciences of the Leibniz University in, in Hanover. Her teaching contents focus on architectural theory, design theory, design principle, as well as wingspans of modernity. The primary fields of research are reflexive design, urban architecture, along with the aesthetics and contextuality of architecture, art, cities, and nature. Uh, Margitta addresses directly the various research approaches and strands that want to explore the tacit dimension um, already since, since several years. And one of her key notions is the term reflexivity in theory and praxis practice, but we will learn more about that very soon. Uh, Makita has been invited lecturer, reviewer, and expert in diverse national and international institutions, and is the curator of the annual symposia on design and research in architecture and landscape, DARA, uh, which is a, an annual symposium in particular also for PhD students since I think since 2007, it exists already, or 2009, something like that, but at least more than 10 years, you will correct me uh, immediately. But it's an uh, extremely important uh, international platform for architecture PhD uh, students. And uh, Makita, of course, has uh, many, many publications, articles, books on that uh, topic. Uh, I just mentioned a few, for example, she edited uh, Intentions of Reflexive Design, Design and Research in Architecture and Landscape. It came out last year, 2021. And in 2020, uh, Shaping Design, Media of Architectural Conceptions. And in 2018, Processes of Reflexive Design, Design and Research in Architecture, uh, and landscapes and of course many other publications the list is very long and uh, i uh, cannot uh, uh, i i it's actually too it would take too long but of course her focus as i said is on design and research in architecture or the mutual relationship between them both but also between landscape and architecture and just very recently or it comes out very soon she just uh, uh, sent it to me uh, a book which will maybe come out in summer or fall, Landscapeness as Architectural Idea. And maybe uh, Makita will also address this. I don't know. So her title is In Between Realm, Realms, Which Kind of Perception and Action is Supportive to invigorate, in, invigorate the Interplay of the Known, the Tacit, and the Unknown. So yeah, I'm looking forward to your lecture, Magita. Then uh the stage or the zoom stage is yours thank you the screen thank is you yours. angelica <clears throat> thank you i will oh share my screen now it's not here it's here yes mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Angelika and Eva, for the invitation to present some notions 
on my position to tacit knowledge in this Tech Talk series. I'm happy to contribute. My talk will unfold around three main aspects of my position <clears throat> and interest in tacit knowledge. A short glimpse on distinction in concepts <clears throat> pardon, of tacit knowledge, a proposal to relate this perspective with reflexivity and sur reflexion, and an exemplification of the capacity of tacit knowledge for architectural design and research. Which I will, um, which will be um, focused with the lens of repertoire. It's very difficult to speak or to research or to think about tacit knowledge because we always want to transmit <laughs> our uh, our insights, and as we all know, it's so incomprehensible that it's very difficult to talk on this. So we had in the last, um, in all the tech talks, I think, but especially in the last ones, which, which are um, here, which have taken place in the context of the Vienna, these lenses are um, episteme, narrative, authorship, and we have now this um, lens of, my tacit knowledge and I will link it to the repertoire. It's not really only my tacit knowledge as a researcher, but my tacit knowledge with the lens of architects to show some kinds of perception and action with our, which are supportive to invigorate the interplay of the known, the tacit and the unknown, because I think one of the distinctions in the tacit knowledge context may also be that there will rest a, a blurred ground of unknown, of unknowing. Yeah? And this, is, this has very different aspects, but this is not our topic today, but it, it's tacit knowing. I will align um, that before the background of Michael Polanyi's publications, Personal Knowledge, which is much um, more, um, um, has, uh, is much more enlarged in his uh, remarks as uh, tacit knowledge from 1966. And I want by them, uh, by which we, with both his um, publications, he wanted to modify the predominant conception of knowledge by including of knowledge and objective knowledge and objectivity by including and focalizing and not completely and not precisely explicable knowledge of a person, yeah? of a person. And he also um, in, yeah, introduced the term of tacit knowledge. I switch to tacit knowing, <clears throat> which is in his view, embedded in processes of perception, judgment, expectation, decision-making and action. In other words, the tacit is linked to the practical, the practical, not the production. Yeah? The practical could also be a theoretical, um, a theoretical um, thing. It's linked to the practical and it is present in the ways we think, recognize, evaluate, perceive and act. Compilating some of the very extensive remarks in his personal knowledge publication, I'm, I'm at rereading of this, especially in this first book, it is possible to sketch the perspective in a three-folded manner. This touches the designer, the researcher, and the collective. So, the first person, the perspective, I, I think um, tacit knowledge is a perspective, not a phenomenon, but the perspective to look at knowing of people. And we can say there might be a first person um, perspective, an actors and creators knowing, which is more or less internal, and a third person perspective, an observers knowing which might be distant or immersive. That is 
open. I will, sh I will show that in my exemplification. And a collective knowing of embedded, which is embedded in the common ground. So this is a provisionally distinction, but it is also discussed and in current um, discourses on tacit knowing in economies and education and in other disciplines. So here, I, we can find in this distinction, we can find, um, let's say, a hint both to Wittgenstein's family resemblances <laughs> and <laughs> a fruitful complement of tacit knowing with reflexivity. It was <clears throat> the French anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu who, mm, yeah, who gave us a lot of interesting um, notions on what reflexivity might mean. For example, as a systematic exploration of the unthought categories of thought. The unthought categories of thought is the citation. Reflexivity as the collective habitus. And reflexivity as embedded in practice of a field. That means a socially structured area with, which has its own ways of knowledge. Pierre Bourdieu links reflexivity to a huge extent to the revealing of latent assumption, to the preferential systematic uncovering of unthought, intuitive, embodied features, which are or could be preconditions of conscious practice. It's a practice theory. By explicitly striving to attentively understand approaches, decision-making and embeddedness, the reflexive stance integrates questioning, questioning mindsets and ways of acting as well as recognizing, exploring and detecting ways of creative knowledge generation and gain in architectural design and research. And he um, suggested to look at lenses, actions, and relations in this context and get also a kind of radical freedom by bring it into distance and question it. Bourdieu's concept of reflexivity aimed at enhancing knowledge generation and knowledge gain by a plurality of points of view as well as by interactions with media and materiality. And in some points, he hints to what um, his contemporary philosopher um, Maurice Merlon ponty pointed out in his different um, researches and, and remarks. A further relevant idea from him, which he, um, which he um, brings forth, is the idea of the reflexive in the work of um, everyone or in the, in the existence of everyone described as factual existence of human being, which is perceived on a sensual physical level as fundamental for raising awareness and sensual and perception as cognitive sources of reflection. And also he opted for different aspects and for plurality of being which is more than the plurality of use. It's a plurality of being and for the recognition of meaningful qualities of an active and contextually embedded perception and its vitalizing character. Furthermore, merlon ponties objective was not only to reveal grounds for experiences, but also to highlight the capacity of reaching beyond existing structures in order to generate others. He thereby invited to understand vagueness, what we are, what we are in when we are looking to tacit knowledge, to understand vagueness as a positive phenomenon and link it to artistic ways of producing alterity, to extend, challenge, or change perception of realities, a competence which he also named surreflexion. 
And the reflex is focus, which is also a very current um, topic in artistic research discourses as a critical and liberating approach was first um, um, mentioned by the um, art, art theorist uh, Clement Greenberg, who said that this, that this um, could strengthen the own position and the position of the discipline. And here we are again in the, in the questions about these different perspectives of the first person, the third person and the collective. What you offered us the concepts of habitus and field to get awareness. And I will uh, reference to this. According to this, it is a set of acquired characteristics that are the product of social conditions and which, for that reason, may be totally or partially common to people that are product of similar con conditions. An example which leads to the repertoire might be the installation of um, Valerio Olchati at the Biennale in Venezia 2012. With the topic Common Crown, the curator, architect David Chipperfield, asked both the relevance of commons, of public space, architecture in the city, and the mental and physical territories which are shared in architectural culture, the collective, the common ground. The Biennale itself is a situation of encounter and exchange. And the president, Paolo Barazza, of the Biennale, in, of all the Biennales in Venice, added in this context the questions, are these exhibitions instruments of knowledge, documentations, emotional experiences, or is it particularly the capacity of emotions and imaginations which lead up people to knowledge and generate knowledge? Valeria Olchati's answer to this question was an installation with a huge light table, which you can see here, and a free hang suspended ceiling for the presentation of photographies and pictograms. He had invited 44 international architects to show references which are driving forces in their design work, up to 10. He later um, published a book which he called The Images of Architects. You can see here some examples, which distilled two images of this out of this 10. Uh, Olchati described these presentations as a form of writing with images. What was to be seen was very widespread, but opens up a wide range of people, including for uh, opens up the architectural realms for a wide range of people, including laymen and laywomen. What is part of architectural culture? from relations to nature and reading and drawing to structures, materials, reuse of ruins and so on. But are these only images of architects? To what extent does the third person, the observer's perspective, grasp the knowledge of the third, first person? To what extent is explicit knowledge here presented via visualization to what extent is explicit knowledge furthermore suited for orienting know-how to come back again to the question focalizing knowledge gain here we have or might discover knowing formation via and purely via layers and mixing of everyday knowledge theoretical knowledge knowledge linked to things, processes, people, groups, and of subjective and intersubjective knowledge. Should we keep asking in more detail for values, procedures, and features in between the location in human subjects and their bodies and the collectively shared? I will now offer 
focalizing the interplay of the explicit, the implicit, and the unknown, as well as the potentials of taste and knowledge by the lens of repertoire, and introduce this by a reference to M Michael Polanyi's personal knowledge. A quote, it commits us passionately and far beyond our comprehensive comprehension to a vision of reality we live in. Archives and repertoires are instruments of thought and actions by which our mute abilities keep growing in the very exercise of our articulate powers. Archives, archives are usually linked to supposedly enduring materials as text documents or buildings. Etymologically from the Greek RK, archive, the term archive refers to a building and also means a beginning, a first place and is linked to power. What is not in uh, the, the everyday understanding of archive, what is, what is not um, um, staying or stable, what changes over time is the value, the relevance or the meaning of the archive, how the items it contains get interpreted, even embodied. The repertoire and acts embodied memory, all the acts usually thought as non-reproducible knowing. Archives can become frameworks by building repertoires. I again cite Marilyn Ponty and this person of, out of the personal knowledge book. When we accept a certain set of presuppositions and use them as our interpretative framework, we may be said to dwell in them as we do in our body. The process of selection, memorization, and internalization and transmission takes place within, then within specific systems of presentation and representation. And the different ways of embodied acts are possible often in the states of againness. So we can say maybe in architecture or even this could be transferred to other, to other um, disciplines. We can say the thought, notion, and abstract generic ideas, which are in concepts, are one possible um, part of this background of repertoire and archive, which we can find in the offices as a transversale in the workflows. Yeah? including corporality and sensuality in the workflows and acting is not only routine, not only everyday production and not only knowledge and skills application. It is also exchange in the workflow of the everyday, um, of the ideas and the concepts of the people which are present, the people which are the, the designers, the founders and um, producing um, producing different contributions to the design. So we can ask whether this concept as um, in this a community of knowledge of the office are uh, in, trans in the workflow and as a transfer transversal of the everyday production going into the building and, and can be perceived in partly in the building, even maybe by not um, experts or not architects. Also, we can say the contemporariness yeah, of people are part of this, um, of this um, pool, let's say, or this background. So concepts work across um, the conditions and are linked to conditions, experiments, and, and um, also maybe to innovation and are communicated, for example, by the projects or in the projects of different architects. Um, and at the moment, we have the, the, uh, 
the big question of um, climate change and what can be done. And there are uh, different examples where architects like to contribute to this context. And we can um, see this contemporariness in such um, designs for excavating what is under the ground or melting um, melting build structures, conventional build structures with plants or not this <laughs> experimenting with woods and the construction of woods or um, showing the relations of humans to nature in new ways like Yunya Ishigami um, did it or also by communicating it and discussing it in discourses of let's say journals like this um, Harvard from Harvard. You also can say that concepts, mm, concepts work across distance over time and space yeah? and can separate the source of knowledge from the knower, which relevant have authorships in this context and the work forms and the manifestation forms. I think they also have some a history. Every of this concept um, has a history, and this begins with the with the uh, production. Yeah? The Nolly plan is not from only from Jean Battista Nolly. Yeah? He was a researcher and did the observation on site, and afterwards they were like in an office. Yeah? Uh, a lot of people who are producing these plans yeah, and who are adding their knowing, where, whereby the Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> Homo mensura human proportion is um, up to, to uh, today linked to one person, to only this um, personal way of doing. And also we can ask whether the authorship and the work form of the research within the student um, units by, um, by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi and Isimur, um, how they do it with their students, who is the author, what, will, what have the work forms been, and the manifestation forms, I think, is that in our case, the students <laughs> In their, daily, in their daily work and conversation, use the learning from, but don't, rem, don't not remember where, where it stems from and what it means. They all use this learning from, they are part of these concepts, getting their own history. And this is also, I think, a part of um, the collective common ground and tacit knowledge to cite and learn from. Another part and parcel of this um, you know, background of the archive and the repertoire is can we see in the inventories, which are itemized in, in the um, definition of the Merriam-Webster, these are itemized list of current assets yeah, uh, or survey of resources. And this could be also questions, yeah, lists of questions, which include contemporary um, contemporary challenges, for example, here, um, the they, uh, Academy for Architecture, Culture in Hamburg has uh, produced also a contribution to the Biennale in Venice in 2016. And um, they, they, um, they, they put it on the wall, all these questions they have um, um, worked out in their courses for the contemporary architectural design tasks. Inventories also could be post-project analysis, as we have in these photos from Christian Keres, who make photographs of his own projects and how people, uh, how people are living in his projects and, and, and interacting with his projects for to learn what he can change the, the next time. And, and he once with this reflexive actions, he again mm, wants to concentrate his attentiveness on 
bodily ex experience, perceptual acts, and also socially interaction. And his whole um, his whole homepage is full of inventories of different kinds. He's <laughs> he is the one <laughs> who is. <laughs> I I don't know how to characterize this. Is it's it's a uh, yeah, it's a huge amount of uh, um, flowers and buildings and people and and everything is um, is um, presented or fr in from his view uh, is observed with this with this um, series of photographs uh, where you have not only cases but also um, um, different perspectives of one uh, of one situation like here or you have different um, different cases to compare them even such which miss some aspects which are in um, these projects these procedures are in a specific way transferable and reproducible also they will not be of the same arrangement or with respective pieces by other actors so the common ground is of knowing is also the knowing of procedures for recognition i think this knowledge areas here are externalized and at the same time they remain bounded to the personal knowledge embodied and embedded in this category we also can um, sort them thematic collections which um, have uh, the attentiveness for matters of concern like bruno latour would call them to uncover the wells and abundance of large variety to use them later. This, are, this is a thematic collection of um, AM2N, EM2N in Zurich, a Zurich office, which you see have this <clears throat> infrastructure and landscape um, focus or the spongy structure focus or the convex concave constellation. They have a lot of this um, thematic collections and also um, Oda Pelmke produces with her students in her units at the Theo Kaiserslautern uh, repertoire, um, uh, repertoires as overviews to um, specific details which she, phenomen uh, which she brought out with them in phenomenological investigations of selected space constituting elements and they draw them and analyze them with, with um, you see, this is a, also a combination of text and um, photographs to draw and analyze them, which serves <clears throat> for the processing of architectural references for the students. And these are not known, not, or let's say, not very much important architects or, or very well-known buildings but it's it's out of the everyday context this repertoire of forms is also a base and material for architectural discourse and design and the last um, aspect of this um, repertoire lens the last aspect for today i have some more but for today is the model as a system of postulates or archetypes or role models, which include also typology. <laughs> we have this typology as shared a set of similar spatial characteristics also um, in the talks of Lara Skriver, Tom Ava, Martin Christoph Graf. Yeah? So we can, we can, um, reflect on this, why, why, did, why, why it is um, emerging so often. But I think we have to ask here, to question <laughs> this typology, typology episteme or lens or how you want to call it, because it's often concentrated on superior architecture. And, and I think it should include or not, we, we should ask it, or we should um, 
extended by inclusion of vernacular architecture of cultural diversity like on here uh, on the left um, you can see a courtyard house in Buenos Aires yeah? and it's, it's very special and it's, it's a special type in a special cultural context and it's also used in special ways and we, we should extend it also um, to look at the connections of architecture and other contexts or architecture and infrastructure. The street is also a typology which is very important for design and also for architecture. The context, the, the way in which the buildings are linked to the street, not, not, only, um, not only the buildings are important as, as separate objects and also the, the the context of architecture and landscape. And we can say maybe we also should look at the morphological lens, which includes variation and transfer, and what it, what it transmitted and how these new um, interpretations and variations um, show not only a placative taste of knowing, but also some kinds of acting. And a last <laughs> extension to the typologies I want to suggest here is the way typologies are transformed. Yeah? Or would you would you would you interpret this Empereur in Marseille from Norm Foster as a pavilion? Is it a pavilion? Is it is it linked to pavilion typology, or is it more only public space typology? What these three examples have in common is that they are um, that they have an impact to produce public space or to produce interaction between people. What is then, what is the transformation dimension of these typologies? To bring about new models or to bring about new forms of designing architecture. And the last aspect of this is other role models, yeah? practicing of acting and reflecting, observing, reading, selecting, extracting and adaptation. Yeah? The selected and the experienced as a basic tool and formative actor in design and in research projects. Yeah? So we can say to, to read books, to have the context of artistic or, or the everyday, yeah? to go to the sites, yeah? to discuss with other people, to visit um, old and new architecture. These are all parts of the repertoire of architects. A repertoire is a territory of examples, capabilities, tools, and <laughs> I'm unsure <laughs> if I should add emotions or <laughs> should I add atmospheres maybe, I don't know, but um, I think it's a part of it. Notions, navigation and triggers which are available for the architect or the design team in a fundamental way so that they are able to operate them for different tasks and potentials. It's also a kind of knowledge conversion, yeah? or there might be a kind of knowledge conversion from here, from the sponge, um, from the Menger sponge into, a, um, into architectural uh, structure. Yeah, to transform certain forms of knowledge or of tacit knowledge, what is enacted in the design process then. It should be thought the, the, um, the, uh, no? the repertoire should be thought <laughs> in a viable conception as an order of arrangements as variably and similar and divergent and an in-between realm and 
Valeria Olchati himself has an archive, a tableau, or a, um, which he converses into a repertoire, and he works with, with this. Um, he has a, a lot of examples, and he always makes a selection and reduces these examples over the years. Here you see a, here you see a visualization of the tableau of 2011, and you, you also can see that it in, included um, historical and contemporary um, examples. It included plans and and um, and details details, and it also included artistic work and and landscape and so different things that we we are we are not clear about how they are converted to a design, how the intuitive improvisatory and situated acting, which comes out or with this explicit knowledge for himself, which uh, was embedded, embodied and incorporated, mingles to a qualitative enriched process in the design context, in the actual design context. And also, I think this is what we can observe. We cannot observe the, the, real, um, the, the real moments of transfer, which are called creative moments. The last example, no, no, not the last, but <laughs> nearly the last example, is this model city of bar architecture being composed of different models, for example, of Mosai Ginsburg, Navgovkin building the do-it-yourself method of Walter Siegel as building kit and um, with a kiosk in Neapel and the street life of Neapel and also own projects. This ensemble serves as a repository and working tool for this architectural office. And it is in this uh, making it um, visible they want to make with this um, how these parts of their model city inspired them for their design. They tried to, with this graphical um, contextualization, they try to show us how, um, how it works. This is, I think this is one of the most um, differentiated I found up to now in the contemporary architecture as this cognitive and materially articulated repertoires that underlie competent behavior as a, as a mental substance, as well as mental and practical crafting process dealing with that substance. They may perceive the knowing that are implicit in them in, in a special degree. And the last one is also a, a post um, creation. Um, so, and a pro creation context yeah, for, of ON Studio with a, a, a design, they call it design models. Yeah. In, they started this with um, drawings on movement and, and expanded it over the years and over and over again, yeah, because this is their main topic or some of their main topics. And, and they question then the potentials and the operative parts and references and their connections in design and research, and especially here in morphogenesis, versioning, parametric design and workflow processes. So we have these um, ways of working in very different contexts and different um, and um, with very different orientations and alignments, but, but remains unaccessible and unexplicable are the ways these resources of tasted knowing operate as practical abilities for the creation of design and how they are and how they act as common tasted knowledge. There, I think there is no one-to-one -one representation um, of this, of the, Tasted knowing and yeah? of, uh, of the way tasted no tasted knowing is can be understood. It's it's a perspective. It's not the phenomenon. In between realms, they combine the repertoire and the archive, explicate 
articulated, explicative articulated and exposed practice, as well as fields of aesthetic, the cognitive and the reflexive. Tacit knowing interpreted with this lens appears at the same time mediated and unmediated. The perspective of tacit knowing contribute to our quantum common ground as a creative challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Margitta. Thank you very much uh, for your lecture. This um, is a very good basis. And I just very quickly for, uh, in, for because we, uh, uh, I don't want to uh, waste your time. So actually, but I want to introduce for you the next lecturer. And later on, after Gennaro will give his talk, we will have People could, you could also ask a question to Margitta Buchert. So Gennaro Postiglione is our next lecturer. Um, his title is My Tacit Knowledge in Architecture. He is a full professor in interior architecture at the Politecnico di Milano, Dipartimento di Progettazione dell'Architettura. Is that correct? Yeah. Perfetto. <laughs> okay. Perfetto. Thank you. Um, his researchers, but he's an architect as well. He's a researcher and an architect, and his researchers tackle broadly the concept and the idea of uh, domestic interior, interiors or all kinds of interiors at the intersection be between people, places, and practices, crossing architecture, ethnography, and material culture. The same theoretical background nourishes also his research by design activity focused on adaptive reuse of minor and neglected heritage. He understands research and teaching and tries to be consistent with as an integral part of design practice. So he's an uh, research and architect and a an designing researcher uh, in this uh, mutual relationship, if I do understand this. Uh, right. He, of course, also uh, has many uh, publications. Uh, what, as as uh, his professorship already suggests, there are, uh, of course, titles or publications on domestic uh, interiors. On there's one publication on iconic houses. I think it is called. Uh, I, I do not know. It's translated to German. I guess is that correct. Uh, but he also has a focus on um, architecture of Scana Scandinavian modernism. He did uh, write on the architecture of Sigurd Leverenz and Sverre Feen. I don't know whether you probably will also uh, show us some examples from Scandinavia. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to your very personal approach to tacit knowledge and Yes, uh, please, uh, it, the stage is yours, Gennaro. Thank you very Thank much you. for being here. Thank you, Angelica, very much for the very kind introduction. Actually, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to present uh, my work, let's say my interpretation of the lecture series. And also very much, I have to say, challenged by the presentation of Mar Margita. But already a few weeks ago, I was um, coming after Margita, and then it's always very difficult. Uh, somehow you touched upon so many issues with a so clever and clear approach. As Angelica said, I, I decided to have a more personal take and. Um, and therefore, I, I decided to call it MIT as in knowledge in architecture. Thank you again to Ika uh, for the invitation. Talk talk has uh, been quite a successful lecture series. Uh, I will now try to reduce everything and to uh, um, say if I'm able to. Yeah, OK. Perfect. So what what I what I will be looking at uh, together, and yeah, I hope in twenty minutes, is some reflections I've been doing uh, since uh, last uh, few years. Probably also do my sabbatical. I've been looking at uh, my let's say research trajectory, and I saw that actually. Uh, 
I've been very much uh, interested in, uh, let's say, being on site. Uh, I, I would say since my since I started my education in the beginning of the eighties. And I understood actually that uh, this is a special, uh, had a very special and unique role in my education. And uh, it played a role also as a, as a practitioner and as a teacher. So I mean, uh, I do mean visiting, let's say having direct experience of meaningful architecture, places and spaces. At the beginning, I started like um, under the tutorship of my uh, mentors at school, as you can imagine. And then I continued uh, alone or together with uh, colleagues. And I would like to just to share with you, uh, the, I would call it the very first uh, seminal episodes. Uh, it was a summer trip in Italy. Uh, it was uh, with two classmates. I then they became my partner in our practice in Naples. And it was a trip to visit some uh, Renaissance buildings that were included in our, let's say, it's a compendium of architectural history. We were preparing our architectural history exam for the fall, and we decided at a certain moment uh, we could not really understand what was uh, the description in the book. And we decided, let's take the car and let's see what we are able to see and to visit. And then this was an incredible adventure. We spent a week traveling through Italy in front of uh, amazing buildings, reading uh, the books, descriptions. Uh, we had two or three of those books with us and we were starting, I mean, even, uh, I mean, discussing whether or not the description was correct. And if we really felt that this was uh, what was there. And this was actually an unforgettable and illuminating trip. I think it would bond us, up for sure me, but also my two colleagues to architecture forever. And this is where probably I would say I started to um, love architecture as, um, um, as a, a sort of Marco Biraghi in his book, Questa Architettura, uh, as a professor of architectural history at Politecnico di, Mil di Milano, he wrote that uh, the labor, physical and intellectual, profused, profused into the making of meaningful architecture, not only manifests the filia, the deep love of its author for it, but actually also provokes love in the one who is interested to experience it. And this is actually exactly what I would say uh, um, uh, Adolf Loos writes in the very last pages of his architecture, where we say, we all know if we find a mound in a forest that is six foot long and three foot wide, made from soil, hipped up in a pyramid, then we immediately become somber and something tell us someone is buried there. That is architecture. So therefore I would claim my education as fundamentally based on, on tacit knowledge uh, acquired via body experience of meaningful places and spaces of architecture, com complemented of course by visual and textual knowledge. These, the two producing what I, uh, I would call the knowing process. Uh, I'm very happy that also Magitta mentioned many times this was knowing, I referring here to Louis Kahn definition of knowing that is a, I took from his vocabulary and for Kahn knowing something personal and alive and therefore evolving through the time. And I would say that actually this process is an open and permanent uh, uh, acquisition process since it started that and during my education and still is going on. Showing my deep love, my deep philia for architecture manifestations. As you can see here, um, represented in the allegory of architecture by Charles Hazen, 1755, mm, that was used, as you, I'm sure you know, as a cover for the Essay sur l'Architecture by Marc Antoine Logier. The mother, the lady, the mother, architecture admires with love, with philia, deep philia, the primitive heart. 
love represented by the presence of Cupido, that you could see a burning flame and you could see a burning flame on his head. And uh, that is showing the deep philia for the archetype of architecture, the primitive heart. With uh, the mother probably saying, look, this is architecture. So I would say that I direct the body experience producing, uh, uh, producing the knowing is, uh, is what I am really feel has been my thread in my uh, research trajectory. And this has uh, resonated uh, constantly in the way I think. And I, yeah, I would say I think architecture being it research, teaching or practice. You can say that here uh, there are some covers of books that shows what I did in research. Probably the research is the being of um, the first and probably the more natural field of activity in which to, uh, let's say, uh, convey or reflect on this love, deep love for architecture. I would say that every paper, every essay, every book, etc. I added it, it's always a follow-up of my urgency to both nourish my knowing of architecture first, and at the same time to share it with my community of practice. And this is why more many times books are connected with exhibitions and uh, other forms of uh, sharing knowledge with uh, a vast audience, not only within the community, my own community of practitioners. So this is where uh, work such the one on Norwegian uh, funkies that were mentioned, Scandinavian modernism, or Sigur uh, Leverens, or Sverefen. Here is the is, um, exhibition at the Basilica di Vicenza that I curated in 1997. They come from. And this specific character, I would say, of microproduction is evident in the language I use in my writings. It is a language of an architect speaking to an architect's audience, speaking about architecture. Every time I did lose this specificity, I became vague, probably stepping in the shoes of a, an architectural theorist or an architectural critic. Shoes for me, very, very difficult to take on. And the same kind of uh, approach has been characterizing my teaching. Uh, so it's a place where I would say I see ex very clearly, <laughs> let's say connected, this deep love for architecture and the urgency to visit, to share, to understand, to know, and in this double meaning of knowledge and knowing. And uh, uh, this imagining uh, being, um, Having been teaching architecture of interiors or interior architecture always starts from uh, designing on the existence, but of course it's also related to study trips. But the idea of, um, of the work on the existence probably is the most direct influence uh, between my love for architecture and my practicing of teaching. Since uh, I would say that every design experience in interior architecture starts from uh, uh, the survey. You have to visit the site. You have to direct experience the place. You have to understand what is at stake there. And this uh, is, of course, a personal understanding, the knowing that Louis Kahn was uh, mentioned when referring to in contraposition to knowledge. And of course, these um, investigations of architectural quality at stake uh, should be, you should be able to find it also when you are not in front of masterpieces, hmm, like uh, the neglected heritage that Angelica was uh, mentioning before. There I would say that in acting on the existent, your knowing, my knowing, is made directly evident in the design I do, students do transforming every act into a sequence of uh, interventions up to the exhibition. That is a moment that catalysts the knowledge that you have been able to produce. Also, this thanks to um, the productivity of different forms of representations. 
from textual to visual, including drawings, pictures, and models. This was time working and last year together with a colleague from the School of Politecnico, Paola Briata, as a research aiming at exploring the generative value of ethnographic representation, testing the hypothesis that a key step in ethnography for designers occurs in the transcription phase, graphical photographical test work. Through a series of case studies, the work of professionals more or less explicitly engaged in architectural ethnography will be unpacked. This investigation aims to understand if and how the ethnographical posture may be transcribed into effective representation of the interweaving between the social and material culture in spatial practices, and to understand if these representations provide useful information for design and for testing design. I would uh, like also to claim that the typology that has also been a word uh, that came out in uh, Magitta is uh, very central. I would claim that typological, that, and I refer to the typological not so much actually um, mentioning a taxonomy of um, related function, but actually to spatial articulation. So for me, it's typological quality uh, is addressed by investigation of spatial uh, uh, articulation quality that the building has. So the typological uh, quality of the existent, I would say, thanks to this investigation through the teaching, I would claim that is inversely proportional to the alteration a design proposes, being uh, typological quality a sort of architectural affordances. This is to remind uh, that architecture goes always beyond its practical function and leaves beyond its, uh, what is, uh, let's say, uh, its the direct goal. And this is also why we are interested in architecture from, uh, from the past and not only the one of the present and uh, not only as a historian, but as uh, practitioners. As Peru Lafiel, uh, Professor Emeritus at the School of Architecture in Oslo, uh, referring to the work of some of his masters, such as Louis Kahn, Giancarlo De Carlo, and uh, Fenn, Zverefen, he writes in, in this book, The Power of Circumstances, quote, the quality we appreciate in their work today do not rest on elements such as new materials, technology use, or their functionalism functionalism, et cetera, but it's their ability to connect the knowledge available to their inner knowing, where well, knowledge still referring to can, it's something we learn from books and knowing is something developed by individual and therefore something very personal. So architecture goes very much far beyond its scope functional scope and uh, challenge uses, different uses. I would say, yeah, that the big uh, shift is between uses and functions. Going to practice, uh, I would say that there is uh, the field where probably is the elective field where uh, the impact of Tazi knowledge uh, can be detached. It's very, difficult to express how, and we have seen that this mainly remain unknown. Um, so it's, I mean, uh, consistent and valuable, but also most difficult to describe since the knowing related to direct experience and of meaningful places and spaces, it is not to be understood as a collection of references. It's not the direct, uh, moving of images from one field of collection of from one repertoire to the actual practice to mention the words of uh, Magitta before. And therefore it totally embodied in the final artifact to be, let's say, rediscovered, reanalyzed and restudied. I would say also that uh, hmm, knowledge consist of elements and solutions, while knowing consists of processes. Therefore, the history of architecture is not understood only as a sequence of stories, 
people, buildings, but also as a work manifestation that in its real physicality can be personal, experienced, explored, understood. This is where my task in knowledge is built, again, I would say, on the evidence of the artifact and their multisensorial experience, of course, also of their memories, because they rest in memories. In proposing this specific uh, fragmented point of view on what I collect under the very broad definition of tacit knowledge, or better, we could say tacit knowing, I had a wish or even the need, if not the urgency, to go back to the phys uh, physicality of architecture, that is a spatial discipline, and the centrality of its direct and body experience as a fundamental part of architectural education and its embodied knowing. Let me almost uh, going approaching the end and going back to the so-called architectural ethnography that I mentioned before, and its growing interest, because it is something stressing the relevance of directly embodied experience of architecture, places and spaces, for a thorough understanding of architecture and its inhabitants, and understanding based on the personal knowing, connecting the physical experience with its visual, textual knowledge. Body direct and participant observations are key words for any ethnographer as they were, or used to be, or should be for any architects. This is not the place to undergo a critical deepening of the crisis grieving architecture to some extent, but I would simply underline that something that has been a fundamental character of our education as architect in reflexive design, the body experience of knowing of meaningful architectural places and spaces to put them in action, has become completely dismissed to be apparently rediscovered by other disciplines. What else are, if not architectural ethnography, all the reports, visual and textual, of architectural explorations? Since all our body experiences have been always transcribed into drawings, pictures, annotations, what else do we need to understand? Do we need to understand the urgency to go back to our own foundations and traditions? Il cerchio non è tondo. The circle is not round, should be the translation. Quotation from uh, Before the Rain, a movie by Milko Manchevsky, a um, Balkan filmmaker from 94. I graduated in 1988 and I visited for the first time this little building in 94, the same year of the, of the movie, on my way to Oslo, where I was going to start a visiting scholarship at the School of Architecture in Oslo. Driving from Naples, a dangerous city, I stopped in Malmo to visit the East Cemetery by Figure Levens, where all my luggage was stolen. I saw a sign of bonding between Leverence and me. This is how I understood the event, uh, recurring to my Napoleon tradition to give always a meaning to our everyday uh, life and happenings. And this memory came back to me when in 97, I was asked to edit a monography on his work. And I thought, okay, this is it. But uh, we could say, Il cerchio non è tondo. Now, today, I'm talking to you from my Swedish flat, located just 10 minutes by bike from the flower kiosk. This is far beyond any possible imagination in interpreting the events that, of that summer or many, many years ago. And still, the cerchio non è tondo. Only recently, I understood that one of the most iconic buildings of 20th century, not really in a good shape, we have to say, is located in probably one of the most stigmatized area of the whole Sweden, Rosengort, where thanks to my partner, I've been collaborating to several workshops 
with children from Eregorden, a neighborhood that uh, is the most stigmatized area within an already stigmatized <laughs> context. Great children. A new story maybe will come out for sure. Sabina's PhD in urban study at Malmo University. But in the year, I would like to address uh, my colleagues and friends, plus Ruin and Ula Brom Lesle from uh, Spread, that is, uh, they are part of the uh, TAC Practitioners uh, Consortium, to, talk, uh, to, to take an initiative to bridge the beauty of this architecture with the, let's say, inhabitants of the neighborhood. Probably they are the only able to face such, let's say, uh, challenging uh, regeneration project based on the empowerment of people running parallel to small architectural intervention as they have already done in suburbs of Stockholm some years ago. This is my tacit knowledge, and or better, this is my tacit knowing in action since this is the only way I can understand tacit knowledge as a productive knowing, producing knowledge, producing architecture, producing new futures. Thank you. Thank you, Gennaro. Thank you very much, uh, Gennaro and Magita, for your talks, which uh, uh, really fit very well together. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. And um, yeah, as I, as I said in the beginning, so for, for the audience, please feel free to address your questions immediately into the chat. It's, uh, it's easy because I can see you here. If you are on YouTube, please put also your questions into the, in the chat and um, Martin will gather them and uh, transfer them to, uh, to me or to Eva and me. But uh, maybe when I may start, if nobody wants to, if nobody else has a question, I, I hope, uh, forgive me, Gennaro, when I take you as a kind of an case, even a case for Magita's talk, someone who is explaining how his repertoire uh, his inventory uh, works as a for his, for your proce procedure. You also stress as Magita as well that tacit knowing is a process and not a phenomenon or a, uh, an object in itself. But uh, in order to start with your lecture and then coming back to Magita's, I was wondering because you started as almost all Italian architects I know with Italian examples. It's so, I was wondering whether it's so obvious for Italians with all these fantastic architectural or heritage also, the arts, uh, which is everywhere present in Italy, that uh, you don't even have to think or reflect about this uh, natural inventory, so to say. Um, but could but, but then you 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 came to Scandinavia to uh, uh, to to Leverenz and uh, Sverefen and other architects who live in Scandinavia. Is this what what is this process exactly for you? Is it just a gathering of more heritage or more inventory, or does it really also has the capacity to criticize, for example, your Italian? Uh, basis or because to have a in, uh, to have a kind of an repertoire as uh, Magita was addressing it might also lead to a kind of a bias or to a kind of a limitation uh, mm -hmm. in your uh, in your thinking and then how would you see it yourself and how would you try to avoid this limitation Thank you so much, uh, Angelica. Yeah, uh, actually, what I um, what I tried to um, say at the beginning is actually that's what I learned. How do I learn to look at the architecture? Allowed me, actually, not to. I don't think to have any uh, BS. Uh, I've been uh, walking in the streets. I mean, I remember uh, middle of the eighties being in uh, Oslo and. Um, at that time, I, I found a book on, uh, on uh, Zverefen. I never heard about him. I didn't know anything. And I said, okay, 
this is architecture. No, I said, I, I must have, uh, see where those buildings are and I want to understand what he's doing. And then in many cases, uh, this love for architecture became a really a complex uh, relationship. Then you get known the person, someone asks you to make a book and then you find yourself completely emerged into a, into a, a research uh, that you are uh, a research driven by an interest in architecture in doing architecture so the, the way you have been i mean this is why I, 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 towards the end i put uh, this uh, google uh, drive uh, albums with architecture from the south of uh, sweden where i've been living last couple of years because I think this is what I do. I, I look at things that I love, <laughs> that I find of interest. Then I start to look around, maybe I enter, then I, I try to look in books. If I found information, I try to decode. So it's a process sometimes that is uh, reversed. First, I, I meet the building, then I collect the visual textual uh, information to, to, to make the big picture then I maybe go back to the site to have uh, maybe a more clear understanding and to confirm of not the first, <laughs> the first site love. And, um, and this is, has been, I would say, a pattern. I can see it's repeated many times. This Norwegian uh, funkis, this uh, modernism, post, yeah, modernism, functionalism, so it's a rational architecture from the 20s in, in, in Oslo. It was uh, a completely neglected uh, topic to, to, the, to, the, I mean, to the people, to the scholars in, in Norway that I found of, of a great interest, probably because of the, yeah, we could call the regional, regionalism, critical regionalism or the way they were uh, absorbing the, the the ideas from the continent in a such remote peripheral area of Europe and transforming and digesting with their own uh, DNA and this has been for me absolutely a source of actually of understanding Italian culture uh, from a different perspective. Yeah, uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Andreas. I uh, just I just wanted to add the, uh, something uh, to Magita, and then you can ask your question. Magita, I just want to ask you whether you would see Gennaro's description as a kind of a typical yeah, process, as, or a process of knowing or using this as a process which designs and researches and reflects at the same time as you have described it in a more general way. And what on and also, but also to add to it, what would you uh, say about this danger of limitation to use this inventory? For example, I also remember this um, Biennale contribution by Val Val Olgiati, Valerio Olgiati, uh, with all these images by different architects, which and uh, which. I do not remember all the details, but I remember that I thought, okay, these are the üblichen Verdächtigen. Uh, this is what you might expect what architects uh, present as their pretended uh, reference uh, area uh, from which they also know that it will be shown at the Biennale. Uh, so, uh, there are many things in it where I thought I don't believe that completely. So could you just maybe, yeah, maybe explain that more in a in a more detailed way how you would um, reflect the term of being critical with yourself, as Gennaro was also explaining, or being self-critical, or how could self-critical <clears throat> self-critical process also be addressed within that uh, process or was it too complicated <laughs> yes <laughs> sorry uh, so how, i showed how, uh, i how, showed how this you, example oh. before going to the before going to the repertoire i showed this example and i requested it as only images and only being so selected 
but I don't feel they are so very, very much selected in a specific kind because they show, let's say, also for the students. I have been there with my students, and they they uh, they have seen a lot of parcels and facets, mm-hmm. also people. Um, um, using ruins for their for their own actions and interactions and there also have been some let's say um, wallpaper wallpaper segments by Jörg Meyerha and there have been so many aspects which which are a part of architecture that people who are not so much enclosed in in the theoretical in the theoretical realm, they understand a lot of architecture and they, they had a lot of aspects maybe which they have not uh, in, their, in their experience up to this state. That is what I can, uh, what I could observe with my students, um, observing the students. And I think it's, this is not a repertoire what they, what they presented. Yeah, this was not a rep. I, I presented this example before. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. That, well, yeah. So there is no. I I, th- I saw no car. Uh, no. Yeah. Should I be self-reflexive in, to uh, to cho- to have chosen this example? No. I, I asked. I said no. That's not enough. We have to go deeper and reflecting okay. further. Yeah. And yeah. then I started with the repertoire. Okay. So I don't think. <laughs> This is uh, <laughs> this should be our our point, but my point is more to bring architecture also to to other people, to to every day, to <laughs> to the ladies and mm. the clients and all, all all them, and what can they understand? I think via the vi- visualization they understand parts and parcels of architecture. Also, the students, and the, and this is a good starting point. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I I never think I don't think that we have to to have this measure that that we can catch everything and that that one uh, one architect or one practice or one team can catch everything what is touch in touch with with architecture. No, no, no. This is and not the repertoire is a very personal. I also speak of personal knowledge and what Gennaro presented. That was your second question. In my view, is very much what uh, Michael Polanyi described for the researchers yeah, as a personal knowledge, and he called he called it not love but passion. <laughs> I think passion <laughs> is the right <laughs> word for <laughs> for researchers because to research, in my view, is a passion, even even if it, even if it um, is very interesting and we love it, it's also a passion. Yeah, thank you, Magita. Um, I just was asked to ask you again to maybe to turn on your camera because then it might be it might uh, be more lively when it is becomes streamed but of course we would like to see your faces actually uh, but nevertheless there is there are two questions one by andreas spiegel and one is this class uh Roin, is this a question uh, because it's a just uh, i don't know whether this is a but maybe we start no, with no, no. And then we continue. Okay. <laughs> Andreas, bitte. So thank you for your uh, both presentations. And I wanted to refer to one of your common terms, with, which was practice. Both of you have ongoingly speaking about practice. And uh, I, it could be very helpful to rethink, uh, call it the ancient idea of practice versus technique, versus praxis and techne. Uh, mm-hmm. And the way how you referred to a practice reminded me a lot to the ancient version of practice, which was meant to be opposed to technique. So technique is something that you can learn. We know how it works, but you don't have to understand it. Whilst practice defined, let's say, in Greek ancient uh, philosophy, Aristoteles and uh, and Altera, you can say, is actually something that you cannot really teach. Uh, 
because this is something that you have to find out yourself. You have to focus on something. You have to uh, develop, let's say, your tools, your ideas, the questions you have. But uh, so in that sense, there's a kind of contradiction for me to say to focus on practice in a way, the personal practice and this uh, actually trying to get rid of uh, a kind of objective idea of knowledge, but to exactly question that knowledge by the very personal and subjective practice. So in that sense, I would say concerning Birgitta's presentation, there is a kind of contradiction in it, focusing on practice and at the same time uh, showing something which does not, which uh, shows what you call the repertoire. I would have understood if you would speak about uh, of a repertoire of practices, but not of a repertoire of buildings and, uh, and, and images. And I think that uh, Gennaro was, in that sense, pretty close to this idea of practice, because with always saying my knowledge, my something. So to add and let's say to outline a very personal slash limited thing, which must not be valued for someone else. So you can say you can look at it very differently. So without trying to objectify it somehow, by only saying so, well, we focus on different layers at the same time and there's more and uh, so better. And one also has to add that when you quoted Bourdieu, he had a very critical reading of the habitus because for him, habitus was exactly the restrictive mechanism which does not permit practice, which does not permit practice, but which initiated the reproduction of cultural habits and forms. So uh, Bourdieu's critical reading of the habit would be the uh, mere, let's say, opposite of, of uh, practice in a way. So I would wonder if you could imagine a notion of architecture as practice, as an architecture without technique. So to say, what would architecture mean if you would say it's not a question of building houses, building buildings and using certain techniques, but to, uh, and that's why I'm thankful that both of you referred so much to practice, to think about architecture without technique and what that could mean. Um, it's just more a comment than a question, but it's um, maybe, oh, it's also, there's several questions and several comments, but maybe, uh, Magita, do you want to yeah, um, answer immediately? Maybe it was not clear enough, but I spoke of procedures. Yeah, to, to, uh, to build up a repertoire is a procedure yeah? and, and it, it gets enacted in a design process. And this enacting is a practice and it's a procedure. It's not, um, it was not to on buildings or something like that, but on the way this repertoire, this archive, I will call it an archive and the repertoire is enacted. Yeah, the archive is more the stabile, the stabile um, background and the enactment is in one of the projects. So I don't think that is a contradiction. I, I did not speak on buildings, but on the, on the parcels which build up this background yeah, in architecture. Well, I try to, maybe it was not clear enough. This is the one point. And in the, in the, in the ancient uh, Aristoteles spoke of three. Yeah. He had the he had the episteme, yeah, and as a, as a theoretical uh, uh, layer, he had the practice as a in between layer, and had the production. And what you are calling for technique, I understand when I understand it right. <laughs> this is the production part, or I, I I don't understand what you mean by that. No, exactly. So uh, the techniques, as we uh, hear it, yeah. but it is, it is just a uh, development towards those two, in Aristoteles terms. And also when you say, uh, Arche, you refer to the Arche. And Arche, and very precisely, and I highly agree, you said, first of all, uh, it's referring to a so-called origin, no matter how phantasmatic that would be. But the second and more important thing is the ruling uh, function of the very origin. So uh, a critical reading of archive would mean to get rid of the ruling component of whatever you collect. And maybe I understood you wrong, but I thought the repertoire should be another archive. And I thought, so 
then there's a contradiction. If the repertoire becomes the ruling agent of a practice, then we exactly lost what we want on the, on the other end. No, the, the rep that repertoire flows into the action. It's not the ruling. It flows into. But Fine. I think <clears throat> that that these bridge, that these bridge will be, or or at the moment, <laughs> it is not comprehensible. Yeah, it rests in the incomprehensible, and this this is part of the unknown. Therefore, I made this distinction not only between explicit and implicit, but between explicit, implicit, and unknown. Mm -hmm. Or tested. If I may. Yeah, Gennaro, you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah but because uh, thank you very much, Andreas. Because I, I very much appreciate this. Um, uh, I mean, this uh, contraposition, practice or poesis versus techne in this ancient uh, world. And um, about your question, do you see the possibility of architecture without techne? I think maybe I would say today, this is the only way to do architecture. If you don't overcome the, let's say, all the physicality aspects, constructions, now we have the urgency of the sustainability. I mean, always architecture had a lot of um, constraints, could have been gravity, materials, availability, and so on. But these are on one end, impediments, or one end, you transform impediments into something else. This is why I really stress the relevance to go beyond the function. Buildings do exist beyond their function. This means that buildings uh, exist and will exist, all buildings, architecture uh, will exist only if it goes beyond uh, techne. Otherwise, we will have... Um, like the phone, we, in a few years, we will throw, uh, we'll produce garbage, maybe we invent a life cycle system, but we will be, let's say, continuously rechanging our uh, everyday environment without any possibility to bind ourselves into a room, let's say, as we do now go to the pyramid, so to say, or to visit whatever else. Uh, a uh, masterpiece of architecture that there's not the need, there is no need of a name, uh, but it's uh, something that you experience with a strong, uh, uh, let's say, atmospheric, where you experience strong atmospheric value. Um, and they are, for me, related to uh, the typology, the, sp the special quality negotiated through materiality, of course. But I would say, yeah, that architecture ex exists only beyond if it goes beyond technique otherwise it's uh, something else it's building technology now i don't know if if you are teaching building technology i apologize <laughs> but um, the risk in our schools especially the the, the technical school where uh, those uh, subjects have a really a very powerful uh, role they in in a way uh, is um, no changing uh, the relation, the, the, something that is a tool become a goal. And we should understand we need absolutely, I don't mean that we should go against sustainability or to, to produce, I don't know, pollution for the next generation. Absolutely. But these are, I mean, it's not uh, the goal of architecture. These are the, <laughs> the, all the, let's say, checkbox that you have in your in specific context, time and geographic both time and space you deal with. Yeah. Okay, Andreas, okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, but nevertheless, I, I think it, it, for, for me, it is important that we come to this uh, notion of uh, technology. Uh, I think uh, to me, technology, even Aristoteles, Okay, yeah, this is one thing, but it's uh, we have, of course, today uh, a very specific understanding of technique and technology, and uh, nevertheless, I would not also would also question or challenge any notion which uh, 
has uh, technology also sees technology also as a kind of a negative part of architecture which limits architecture to mere functionality or a kind of a bringing architecture in the realm of technocracy and and that's it technology is always part of architecture also in even in a very uh, basic sense not only with the advanced technology so uh, i think we should also but this, it's less a question it's just a comment i should very much ply for uh, having uh, te technology or techniques uh, very much in mind also in the terms of practice. So I would not ply for making a contradiction between technique and practices because they are also interrelated <clears throat> uh, in, in today's in, in contemporary architecture. Um, yeah, but it's, that's, oh, sorry, that's not, not, not a question, it's just more a kind of a contribution. Um, I just was looking for, uh, even, are there more questions? Then I, I have a que another question to, to Gennaro, because you once mentioned also the, um, the ne neglected heritage or what we, ignore or don't see uh, that's of course anonym uh, architecture which is made by anonymous uh, builders so to say not architects but someone who builds it or it, it just exists uh, um, how would very simple question how do you uh, how do you detect how do you discover how, how how does it come to your mind and what happens with something which has been detected as neglected and what happens then when it becomes visible for others could you just explain this part of your practices a little bit more in detail yes thank yes thank you for it's a challenging question how do you do uh i don't know I mean, um, I what I what I try to say uh, uh, that it, it's um, it's a it's a meeting. It's it's a meeting between you and uh, what is there out there. Um, uh, I don't know. It's it's. Um, I I cannot say how an a, um, I don't know a space or a building attracts my attention. And the, uh, without any special reason, it's not uh, on a map, is not on a guide, is not mentioned by anyone, and then you you feel an attraction. I I started the investigation on the Atlantic Wall bunkers, the fortifications along the Atlantic coast, be made by the Nazi during yeah during the Second World War, because I spent uh, a, a summer in a place where there were a few of those bunkers. And I started to look and I said, wow, amazing, I mean, thickness of the concrete, very special uh, shapes. And then I started to look at those plans and I found a Regelbau. There was a, a compilation of all the buildings according to the functions. They were extremely functionalistic buildings. And then, yeah, and, and then you start, what happens after, uh, after you, discover if you want to if we want to be so let's say colonialist that something need, needs to be discovered by us to exist i don't think it happens anything on one end we could say there has been a growing interest some of those publications um, were uh, of a great interest people had been uh, starting to maybe to work. There was a, a, a very famous work by Paul Virilio on uh, bunkerology, but probably it was one of the very few things that was written on the topic. And there's been a lot uh, said and a lot of uh, transformations, of course, of this heritage into reappropriation. So how to, you in, in the case of uh, a difficult heritage or and so uh, an, an heritage con negatively connotated as the as the bankers then it's you, you don't have only the neglected because has been yeah no one has taken taken care but it brings a lot of uh, negative thoughts and memories so the the appropriation is somehow a, a strong act of disrupting the negativity uh, that they they brings 
So somehow it's a, it's a way to digest the, the story that has been uh, a common thread through all you almost mostly of European countries. So I see as a as a way to re reappropriate your own uh, environment and instead of uh, just uh, turning back here, yeah, turning the back to some of those buildings. We could say the same for, of course, fascist architecture in Italy as a as a it's a difficult heritage with a beautiful uh, look, so it's much more seductive to deal with. But okay. nevertheless, you start to value uh, actually. Uh, you you uh, observe and you. Uh, yeah, maybe you maybe you appreciate or maybe you have passion for something which you have found, let's say not discovered, but found. But uh, at the end, you start to value something and you bring it uh, into your system of episteme of your knowledge uh, system and digest, as you said, in a, in a way or find ways of digestion. Uh, maybe when I take this, I would ask Magitta uh, also about um, this term typology. I, I, I hope I'm right. I, I understand you correctly that you want to suggest that, in fact, the term typology is not very um, a not very helpful term or helpful notion in architecture because you were applying for all these transformation. But usually we t use typology as something which becomes a taxonomy at the end. And the most architects use it as a taxonomy. But you are applying for overcoming typology is that correct as something which has to be more fluid as a no to expand to extend what uh, typology might mean that was the suggestion but the the, the the what you the examples which you show which uh, uh were showing a kind of a transformation of the type uh, uh, a certain type uh, a pavilion which seems to become more a kind of only a structure or a roof with columns and so on but in this case what what does the term type even mean to architecture anymore is it still a kind of a valuable notion Oh, that that's what I was asking. Yeah. yeah. With this with these examples, and I <clears throat> I wanted to show that maybe the program as programming aspect, what what Gennaro also shows with the example of Sprit, yeah, that what people might do or what people are mm. doing and interacting in this context might also be uh, a focus to see um, or to, to, to develop a form. And also, on the other hand, it also could be a, another model from another discipline. Yeah? That's not, we have, let's say, it's often too, too quick that people, that people use the term typology as an all-encompassing, but it doesn't. Okay. So yeah. I think it, it it has to do. I think it has to do with, with what Gennaro is looking for in the minor heritage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That there, that there, that this spectrum is very broader, and we have not to stick in the usual um, or traditional understandings of specific kinds of looking at something. Yeah. Therefore, I I thought you want to suggest that this. Uh term no, or this notion might be not yeah it's not useful anymore for for no architecture that's not, no no i think it's useful in any okay. way but it has to be questioned and extended okay Being that it is a multifaceted um a multifaceted possibility of view of this view but it's 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 a very powerful part of the tacit knowing of architects mm -hmm. that's what i wanted to say it's uh, mm -hmm. i don't want to uh, evaluate these things that's mm -hmm. not my interest huh? i <laughs> i want to produce some new viewpoints huh? not to evaluate to say oh that is and this is nothing but i think 
these are very powerful instruments and they are they build a big part of the tested knowledge of architects and architecture theoretics as well yeah? Yeah. you're also dealing with this maybe think of your lectures you're dealing with this I, i'm sure so i don't <laughs> i don't think it's not it's not uh, we should not keep it but we should okay. question it and and yeah, and look at it with with different with in a multi perspective way and then compare and and find um, with the cases the same cases <laughs> the similar cases and the divergent paces yeah, maybe new possibilities which are not um, thought in beforehand and I think this um, this example I showed this is also was an exemplification of the thought huh, mm -hmm. process with the pavilion um, from from these three different um, kinds of let's say public spaces. Yeah, I do understand. Yeah. Um, I just I do not want to continue because I of uh, you know Margita that I uh wrote a lot about uh, type and typology since uh, i studied the uh, theory of aldo rossi uh, and uh, he was one of these uh, architects who to my to my uh, understanding did fail with this uh, notion of type <laughs> and typology but this is another story so, uh, so is it not archetype is archetypes the same as no typology? he never he never his 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 uh, theory is not about archetypes definitely not and he also made this clear at a certain point because this was a misunderstanding it's really about type and typology uh, however uh, type the type became something i called it uh, i called it a super leistungsform a, a, a form which should be used for anything it should it could be a small item in architecture just a very very detail but it could be also a complete urban structure so it could be used in any kind of in any scale uh, and with any idea, it might be a form, but it might be also an only an idea. So you find in Rossi's writing ver various definitions of what a type might be. And at the end, he failed actually really to say what in his understanding the type might be. But this, as I said, this is another story. So I just was, of course, I was becoming <laughs> alert because I wanted to learn whether you should... Um, uh, apply for an overcoming of this term, but I do, do understand your position uh, clearly. But I just want to look, uh, is there, are there any other questions, comments, remarks? We are already, it's already nine o'clock and we usually have about two hours, but I do not want to stop uh, before maybe one of you <laughs> Andreas, you're the only one <laughs> who has no questions from YouTube. I just learned it, no question from YouTube. So maybe Gennaro, Magitta, if you want to have a last say at, uh, in this round, then I would also, if you want to add something, just maybe briefly something to clarify or to add, extend. Well, very um, to clarify, uh, as I, I think that uh, was very, uh, I, I found extremely inspiring the idea of the unknown that uh, Margit uh, brought up now that we deal uh, with the unknown in, in this process of uh, knowledge in architecture or knowing in architecture. I've been trying through my experience, looking back at my experience, to, yeah, to root it in, in this activity of uh, experiencing building and sites uh, with your own body, let's say physical experiences, not only complemented by textual, uh, of course, uh, and, and visual knowledge. So it's the knowing is a process that is emerging. It's like, it's like we could imagine that the knowing could be interpreted as uh, for atmospheres. It's, a, it's, um, it's the, let's say, the connection and the, the bridging between uh, 
the object and the subject. So atmosphere is not a transcendent, is not something out there. It's embodied in the space, but it's also embodied in the uh, uh, subject. So without subject, you don't have atmospheres in architecture and atmosphere cannot be predicted somehow. And, and uh, the, the author can, on a certain extent, decide, uh, control a number of uh, perceptions of the architecture that's going to happen. But of course, it's like object and affordances. The use of objects goes far beyond what uh, a designer can imagine. And this uh, really the, the, the meeting between the user and, and, um, and the object. I would claim <laughs> that this knowing in architecture is based in this both uh, individual, uh, let's say, experience and uh, what knowledge visual textile produce as a, we could say, objectified. Uh, so it's, it's an open process. And we all know that going back to the same building that we have visited, we might discover other things because we are changed the building and we are able to see things we were not able to understand at a certain moment in our life. So I, I yeah, I would, for me, tacit knowledge in architecture is something absolutely embedded with the experience of architecture complemented by knowledge. Yeah, thank you. Magita, do you want to have, want to add something? No, um, maybe I will add that I'm speaking of tacit knowledge and let's say that we have to be more clear also about explicit knowledge to understand tacit knowledge, if it is understandable in the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for me, this was a tentative suggestion to use the, yeah, the concept of the repertoire to show some of the parcels of, of implicit knowledge and the powers of this implicit knowledge. And I think what I wanted to, to show is how, the, how architects handle specific procedures. And I used examples in which the architects um, ex um, showed their proce procedures. Mm -hmm. I don't want to evaluate this, but to understand this. Mm -hmm as far as it is understandable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Magita, and thank you, Gennaro.